Are you always coming up with ideas? Do you marvel at successful business owners? Do you hate being told what to do? Ever take things apart just to see how they work? Are you a dreamer? If you've answered yes to any of these questions, this podcast is for you. Welcome to the Entrepreneurial Enclave with Kevin Wortham. The podcast that focuses on building, maintaining, pivoting, planning, and investing in you, the entrepreneur. But first, a word from our sponsor. Tapes' Specialties is the world leader in tape manufacturing and specialty conversion with over 40 years of experience. In addition to our pro brand of high-quality specialty adhesive tapes, we provide contract converting services that help improve your profitability, streamline your supply chain, and reduce inventory cost. We offer the most complete range of converting capabilities in the industry, such as... Cloth tape, double coated tape, specialty tape, paper tape, masking tape, vinyl tape, carton sealing tape, adhesive transfer tape, duct tape, phone tape, electrical tape, filament tape, foil tape, reflective tape. And the tape just keeps on rolling. Visit us online today at www.protapes.com or call us at 800 345 Pro Tapes, it's just how we roll. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another fantastic episode of the Entrepreneur Enclave, Life's Coming Attraction. I am your host, and this evening, today, we've got a fantastic show. Man, my dear friend, Jimmy Mack, talk to me, man. How are you? I'm doing excellent, Kevin. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Um, You know, it's uh, every every day in the journey is a gift, you know, so we're uh, happy to be here. Absolutely. So let's let's get started. So it's it's been what, about thirty years, right? Yes, sir. And I first met Jimmy. He was a young man, a young man, starting <laughs> out with uh, inspirations, aspirations, and inspirement. And uh, young entrepreneur. I met him through the Nifty program, NFTE, the National Foundation for Teaching Entrepreneurship, right out of uh, New York That's City, right. started by uh, Steve Mariotti. So a shout out to Steve Mariotti. So. When I met you, you you had this idea of you were racing bikes, correct? Yeah, actually, when I <clears throat> met you, I was in a second phase of my athletic career uh, at uh, 16, okay. doing biathlons, running and biking, sister sport to triathlons. Wow. Wow. Okay. So now, what was the inspiration for you starting a business around that? Well, basically, I got so many sponsorship deals for being ranked na- nationally in the world at the time, and uh, all the big pros on the circuit were asking, how did I get all these sponsors? And uh, I decided um, to network all my own sponsors and represent some of these other guys, these guys are two times my age, yes. uh, to represent them. <clears throat> So let me well let, let's 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 talk about that. How did you get the sponsors? I, I mean, it seems to be obvious that if you're ranked number one in the world, then sponsors would come after you, right? Yeah, I just leveraged the market and my uh, you know my resources around me, which were my sponsors, and then on uh, the food chain of sponsorship development, um, there's a it was a trade show called yes. Interbike. Yes. Interbike was the biggest bike uh, convention in the world. And then also uh, because it's related um, with uh, uh, road racing and time trialing, the triathlon, biathlon side uh, also had a representation at Interbike convention. And I would go every year and solicit sponsors for me competing on the circuit. And then I just had so many and being African American, and there wasn't a lot of uh, African Americans in the sport at the time. I really stuck out besides winning, and uh, people wanted to. Uh, they were very curious. Wow. Let me let me stop you for a second, Jimmy, because I want to I want to unpack this and make sure I understand this. So the bikes that you were using at that time, these were the BMX bikes, correct? No, that's incorrect. Incorrect. Okay. Yeah, biathlons is related to like the Ironman triathlon. Okay. So they're, they're, these are called time trial road bikes. So this is like a 10, in your head, 
<clears throat> it would be like a 10 speed bike. Got you. Got you. So I started my original career in BMX, but yes. what happened was, um, you know, I was doing really good at that. I started a brand and a team in that at a young age, but I got hurt and uh, I, I damaged my kidney. Yes. And my parents uh, forbid me to do it. And so what happened was it all kind of connects in at the end. I had to move like, well, moonlight. And I was basically, I couldn't race anymore. I was doing freestyle in the BMX, but basically my parents weren't having it. So I love racing and uh, from playing, uh, you know, soccer player, I didn't realize I was a great runner. And so when I got in high school, I started running track and became a top track athlete. And so I was yearning to race some kind of bike. And so I went into a running store and saw a form for a biathlon. Yes. And that was a early, they call it duathlons now, but it's, it's related to triathlons, the swim, bike, and run, except this run, bike, run. And I saw a form for it. I begged my father to let me try it. And I did, and I got hooked. And then I came really good, really quick. And it replaced BMX, but it didn't replace BMX in my heart. Gotcha. And long story short, when my parents got divorced and I moved to New York out of high school, uh, 20 years old to start my career. Um, I promised myself when I got on my own, I would start getting back into racing BMX again. Cause I wasn't with my parents. Yes. So basically, you know, I became a top athlete in the world, uh, lead amateur, uh, for biathlons. And, um, the story is kind of tricky or whatever, but, I basically, when I got to New York, I started racing BMX again because I was on my own. Yeah, that was your first love. Yeah, that was my first love. So I came back to it. Now, <laughs> when you when you got into the and excuse my ignorance, when you got into the sport of bike racing, right? Were there a lot of kids your age? Were there a lot of minorities in that space at that time? Um. <clears throat> There wasn't a lot, but in BMX racing, yes. there there was. Okay. Um, it had it was really access if you were a black uh, African American middle class person, you might have had access to it because of wherever you lived. There was yes. BMX tracks. Yes, um, you know, it wasn't accessible for everybody. It just happened. My family moved from Philadelphia. And uh, we moved to the suburbs of Jersey, which gave me access to a lot of stuff we didn't have access to in West Philly. And those and those bikes are quite expensive, right? Yeah, yeah. And so my parents told me they could afford it, but um, because of uh, the hard work ethic of my grandparents and their their uh, hard work ethic, I had to uh, you know figure out how to to raise money to get these things. Got you. Got you. Okay. So that's how I got doing sponsorship because I got good enough to get sponsors and I finance myself with doing it. Now, again, correct me, help me out. Correct me. When you, when you take on a sponsor, are you considered amateur or, or now you, are you a pro? Um, in high school, that would be, it's different, but on the basic level of competing in the sports, you could be an amateur and get sponsorship. Got you. Got you. So now, now how do you become ranked number one in the world? Well, I wasn't ranked number one in the world. I was top 10 in the world. Top 10? Yeah, top 10. That's correct. Okay. How does that happen anyway? How's that happen? Well, you go to certain races and they give you the ranking because it's a, a world championship, a world ranking race, or national ranking race. Okay, but you're racing against other folk uh, from around the world, correct? That's correct. And then you race in your age groups. Got you. And where, where are some of these races taking place? All over the country. I traveled in high school all over the country competing. Well, and so with your sponsorship and the sponsorship dollars, you were afforded to go to these events to 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 uh, participate. Yes. Wow, that's crazy, man. That's yep. crazy. Wow. So I was sponsored by Coca Cola, 
Converse sneakers, power bars. I was one of the first uh, uh, athletes in power bars for biathlon. Yes. Uh, Grip Shift, which is now one of the biggest um, uh, component companies in the world. They're called Saram Corporation now. But uh, yeah, I raced with some of the biggest companies in the world. Avia, Team Avia, um, all while I was in high school. Wow. And so at, at what point do you, and we, we might have overshot that, but at what point do you make your connection to, to Nifty? So... I had already started my business called Pro Elite Management yes. uh, before I got to Nifty. And basically the story was um, <clears throat> kind of ruins a line. So basically my father and my mother were school teachers in Philadelphia. Yes. And uh, Steve and your team basically got your first commercial contract with Michael Milken. Yes or the partnership program he funded called University Community Outreach Entrepreneurship Program, UCOP. And because my father was teaching summer school, he ran into a recruiter who was director of the UCOP program, Lisa Halston. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. And so uh, my father, uh, she recruited at that summer school. And my father heard her speak and he was like, I have a son that has his own business and he's a top athlete. You know, I would love for him to get in the program. So um, my dad came back and my dad was an amateur uh, power lifter. Yes. And um, he basically would say, you know, I want you to go in the summer program. And I was like, well, I already got the business going. I was like, I'm not giving up my summer. And uh, he squeezed his muscle a couple times, <laughs> looking at me. And he said, I think you're going to go to this program. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and then I got in the program. The difference was between me and the other kids was, one, it was a great environment because it was like-minded, but I was like the only person that really truly had a business. Yes. So, yeah, and then Because uh, at that time, a lot of the kids were just starting from scratch, you know, taking, taking a, a... Correct. Taking correct. A passionate but, idea. Right, correct. But yeah. that was the great thing about it <clears throat> was the team of teachers, you guys, you know, were experienced in, you know, really teaching a nuts and bolts uh, grad program for business, you know what I mean? And so I was great at direct sales and marketing naturally and what I was doing, but it really taught me when I went through the program, the nuts and bolts of how to you know, run everything. Wow. And it was a huge advantage to my arsenal, what I was already wow. being very successful at. Yeah, Success, when, yeah, because when I became a part of that team, I think it was the second year that you were at the, yeah. or that we were at the Wharton program prior to me uh, meeting with the team, Steve Mariotti and CJ and Juan and Scott Schickler and those guys. It was like, you got to meet Jimmy Mack. This brother is phenomenal. Well, they didn't say brother, but this young guy is phenomenal. And so, yeah. <laughs> so I had a chance yeah. to meet you, and you certainly <clears throat> did not disappoint. So here, so here we are. Thank you. Here we are kind of chopping it up now. And so you look back over, over your career, and you think that uh, the Nifty program had a great influence in terms of helping you, you know, weed out some of your decision-making? Well, the decision making was there. It wasn't anything to do with decisions because I was already very clearly past on what I was doing. Okay. Um, but the education side of it, you know, was <clears throat> the Gatorade or the uh, the, the carbohydrate <laughs> yeah. for, you know, me going next level. Got you. And being, <clears throat> being, um, uh, I would say, in the like-minded peer group, because I, you know, I never met anybody interested in business beside myself at that age. Got you. And the camaraderie I got from the other students, even though I was miles ahead of everybody. Yes. The camaraderie, the bond, the friendship, and the mentorship of the, the teachers, you guys, was very special. It wasn't a normal teacher situation. Yes. Yes. And all those things uh, super fueled me to do my passion. Got you. 
And so you certainly would recommend, you know, programs like Nifty, programs like the Minding Our Business program for, for young folks who are looking to start a business. Most definitely. Absolutely. And I think that, uh, <clears throat> I think, you know, <clears throat> it should, you know, be included in prime, you know, in primary education, you know, in all grades, you know, yes. and, and that helps, <clears throat> you know, our country grow whether you're an entrepreneur or an entrepreneur and you d treat something like you own it, you know, uh, I, I think it's one of the most important things in society. Uh, and then also teaching the playing it forward, the give back or what I call sweat equity philanthropy or philanthropy yes. should be taught in all these systems. And I've, I've benefited so much from that culture. Yes. Now just now just recently you and I we were talking and I think Nifty celebrated their 35th anniversary. Yes, yes, it was an amazing event uh backed by Goldman Sachs and uh I got to see a lot of old faces and uh it was very inspirational and you know it's uh it's on its new wave uh you know with uh the company Yes, And, uh, you know, the greatest thing is I think even with the endowment or close to the endowment, you know, this is as long as there's planet Earth, uh, Nifty will be in existence. Awesome, man. I love it. I love it. So now give us an update. Uh, where are you today? I mean, what's, what's going so on with the business now? Yeah. So years later, I'm still 30 years later, I'm still in that space. Yes. Uh, morphed into, you know, I had a, a career also in music for a long time on the executive entrepreneurship side. And the plan was to merge action sport or extreme sport culture with emerging culture and entertainment. And uh, now uh, I own two companies. Uh, one is Union Square Shoes. Um, and that is a sneaker company in the space of extreme sports. We compete yes. against bands, uh, sneaker company, DC shoes, uh, you know, basically skate shoe companies. And we manufacture our own brand, Union Square Shoes, which is uh, the online company, unionsquareshoes.com. Yes. Uh, the business is 70% online, 20% um uh, live events. We sell at all the major extreme sport events and motocross, skateboarding, BMX, and surfing. And uh, we're just starting to open up uh, retail partners. It's 5% of our business. Um, I partnered up uh, with one of the top sneaker designers in the country uh, who's designed, his name is Michael Hobbs, who's designed for Cole Hahn, uh, Converse skateboarding is to revamp their whole program and design. Uh, Fila, Puma, pretty much everybody he had a 20 year career. So wow. we met at uh, Afropunk, which we were sponsored by, uh, I was hosting, which is like um, was action sports and music and urban alternative culture. Like uh, people call it like rock music and alternative music. Yes. And, uh, Converse was our sponsor at the time for my other company, Bulldog Bikes, B I K E F. And I was the only African American designer, and he was the only African American skateboard shoe designer. Wow. And uh, we we became buddies through that big event. And then uh, years later, uh, I well during that time period, I had pet project uh, Union Square who uh, doing T shirts and stuff as a sister company to Bulldog Bikes, my, yes. you know, which you know, made a majority of my career with. Yes. And um, yeah, so we got that. It's in its uh, second year launching, four years total in the pro two years process of building it, and then two years uh, going on three years of launching it. Wow. And it's going very, very well. Yes. Now, now and, uh, if you were to look <laughs> back over your illustrious career, right? Mm -hmm. What would you consider to be some of the high points of the of the business, and what would be considered some of the low points as to the business? Hmm. Well, there's a lot of high points, okay. which uh, the high points have 
you know, being uh, uh, one of the first African American bike manufacturers on the cover of uh, Black Enterprise magazine and getting highlighted in that. Yes. Uh, of recently, I was named uh, 23 of the most influential black BMX riders of all time by Dig Magazine. Oh, wow. Congratulations. Wow. Thank you. Wow. Um, and, um, uh, and then failure wise, uh, or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, uh, the things I learned through Bulldog over 20 some years of having that brand, uh, is, uh, if you ever want to sell your company, you know, you got to keep your finances tight. Gotcha. And so part of my growth as an entrepreneur, you know, when you're originally bootstrapping, um, you're not always set up in the long run to sell your business, most entrepreneurs. Wow. Gotcha. The sophistication to your business that needs to be intact yes. so that you can, you know, sell your company eventually. Yes. So, you know, I learned some of those, you know, I learned that and then, um, you know, and, and I guess uh, it wasn't really, you know, it wasn't really any uh, failure or mistakes technically. It was just the, the challenges of being in business Understood. and the, thing, the things that you have to do to keep moving forward, um, the things that aren't accessible. Yes. And different things like that. So they were the challenges that I, we, you know, go through as a young person in business. You know what I mean? I started the one business at Bulldog Bikes at 24. And, you know, I, I didn't, yeah, I haven't worked for anybody, you know, in my lifetime. Yes. So, you know, when it's challenging or you're bootstrapped or, you know, cashless bootstrapped and you don't have a lot of access to credit. You know, that yeah, there were some challenging moments, but you know, I pushed through, you know, got through, and I just kept going, you know, and was able to, you know, make a good living from it. Now, let me, let me ask this question for the, for the listening audience. And I, and I, and this comes from a place of, you know, minding our business and from Nifty. How, right. how important was the business plan for you? How important was the business plan? You know, it's funny you ask that because it, the, I, you know, I'll be very honest with you. It, <laughs> business plan wasn't that important to me. Okay. Now that sounds like kind of crazy, but it wasn't because once I got focused on it and it's arm to arm combat out there, I knew what I, I knew my product. I knew what I wanted to do. And it was just, you know, stay, you know, showing up and sticking it every day. You know what I'm saying? Got you. Got you. Yeah. It, it, now, would you would you recommend that to to other students the importance of the of the business plan? I think it's you know I look at it the business it, yeah, it's such a touchy subject for me because it's a lot it's multi layered like the thing for me is to have like I've got a I have a generic format of doing that okay let's just put it that way okay does that make sense yeah 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 yeah. So my generic Jimmy Mack formula to get nitty gritty and, and you know not uh, you know you know kind of follow the regular transcripts of stuff is one you know you have your you create your brand right or you create your service yes then you create your goals and then you create your financial goals and then. You know, I look at my overhead and look at how much profit I can make. Those basic things are the things that I focus on. Okay, so so you're saying that because uh, uh, I want to get some clarity. Because because so you're saying that you did not do a business plan per se, but you've pulled out what you thought were the most important aspects of the business plan, and that's what you focused in on. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. Okay, that's good. Because I was I was getting nervous for a second. I'm like, damn, man, you know, that that's <laughs> what that's what Nifty and Mob was all about, man. You know. But I, the thing is, I didn't take those things the way most people interpret it. Understood. Like, you know, so 
you know, I understood, you know, the accounting side of it. These are the different things that I took the, the real skill set from. You know, does that make sense? No, no, it, it makes perfect sense. I, I just wanted to make sure that so that the listening audience, you know, because because, again, be mindful. Uh, 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 Nifty has been around for 35 years and they and they have built this strong backbone on teaching entrepreneurship. Uh, MOB, right. MOB has been around for 25 years and the backbone has been the business but plan. I, but the thing is, you know, everybody has a way of processing systems. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So, no, I'm not, you know. No, Jimmy, I'm not. Yeah, so, I'm not, yeah, I'm not well, I know, I got you. But the blueprint, I recommend any entrepreneur that sets the what I call the blueprint yes. for their business plan. But you have to understand the way that I got into it and then got into Nifty and the way I accelerated, I had different ways of processing my, to do certain things. Understood. Understood. Yeah. Yeah. And, oh. that, and, that, and, and that as an entrepreneur, like for instance, you know, I'm heavy on the executive summary, but you know, I'm not, I don't really recommend an 82 business plan. I don't think it made 82 page business plan. You know what I mean? That, that for me, you know, I what the way I process things and do everything. I, you know, I have, a, I do executive summaries for every one of my businesses. Okay. okay. And it's not, and it's, it's uh, right to the point. And it skips all the, the fluff. I do believe that a lot of business plans, especially people coming out of grad school, they're over, overdoing their plan and it's almost logical business isn't logical so an executive summary to me is a um a very good way you know no more than 25 pages uh no less than 12 pages and gets into the nitty-gritty of your business you know what i mean no no i no I, again jimmy I, I i hear you i respect that but i i just wanted the audience to understand that at, at some point, whether you call it the full blown business plan, whether whether you call it the executive summary, you know, someone right. in a position is going to want to expect or suspect that you should have that because that's going to really detail for them, particularly a bank or someone who wants to get into a long term partnership. They want to know that you have strategically thought through the whole process. So whether it be the business plan or, as you say, the executive summary. And I guess the right. I guess the only point I was trying to get to was how important right. would you say the business plan or in your case the executive summary would be for the entrepreneur? Yeah, so I guess to yeah, I mean so I but definitely in the classic way yeah. of what yeah, you know, I call the old school business plan, I'm not a big believer in that. Okay. I'm a believer in fast track executive summary. Okay. I guess that's better to, to explain it. Yeah, yeah. No, that, me, no that's fine, man. That's fine. No. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I can, so, I can see Steve Mariotti now and CJ like, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the other thing, too, is, you know, for me, I never got any money from banks all these years. Gotcha. I got, I did creative financing through business development by getting sponsorship deals and other business development deals. Got you. And so I didn't go the traditional route. So, and as I've grown over 35 years, you know, I was like, wow, like this the traditional 82 page thing that most people have grown up with, I feel that's outdated. And so, the new, you know, the new generation, I feel, is, you know, the executive summer, you know. Give yeah, it to me, lean in me, yeah, you know. Yeah. No, no, that, that's fine. Mm -hmm. I just I just wanna I just wanna make sure the audience is understanding what we're what we're talking about now. Yeah, yeah, no, most definitely most yeah. definitely. So I guess the answer is at the end of the day, on a new gen level, I recommend an executive summary, lean in me with the most powerful important part of it. Obviously, the income statement, obviously, right? Yeah, yeah. And forecasting of five to ten years. Yeah. That's my. That's my. Um, that's my uh, uh, ideology of it. And it's twelve to twenty-five pages, but yeah. all the important big parts of it. Got you. 
Now, you being you being African American, mm-hmm. do you see a lot more African Americans in the space now? Yeah, there's um, you know, it's so funny because a lot of the top athletes in the world for skate, motocross, like the number one guy for the last sixteen years in motocross, supercross, his name was Bubba Stewart. He was the number one guy in the world in motocross. And most people didn't even know that. Even though he was famous, they didn't it wasn't hitting their radar. Wow. And then, you know, in skateboarding, some of the top 20 riders are people of color and African America in the top 20 in the world. Now, now it, how, how did that happen? Did we just morph into that or was the industry uh, uh, in a way trying access. to recruit? No, more access in, in city, urban areas. Gotcha. But there was a thing where the white kids would go to the city and they would call street skate and street skate on obstacles and different rails and other things in the city. Yes. And then then they became accessible skate parks in the urban areas across the country. Okay. And so uh, people of color, Spanish, black, Chinese and living in cities, they uh, the skateboards weren't too expensive and they were able to get on that and ride and for the last twenty years there's been, you know, humongous urban population in skateboarding. Yes. And then with BMX, it became a little more affordable and there was tracks um, in certain areas throughout the country for uh, working class families, low income and yes. middle class got, the tracks got closer to everybody. And so uh, the races weren't expensive to, to race on a local level. Yes. And kids saved their money and, and, you know, they started getting into the sport. And then the black middle class always has been supporting those areas if they had access to tracks in the area, which would, um, you know, give African Americans. And there is a ton, a ton of African American champions in BMX racing. Wow. Ton over the last 40 years, which we're going to, uh, we're talking to Sony Pictures right now. Uh, we have a movie that I'm pitching called um, The History of Urban X. Yep. And it gives a history of uh, all the African Americans and people of color over the last 40 years in skateboarding, BMX racing, and other alternative uh, sports and action sports. Jimmy, now this is what you're pitching? You're pitching this idea? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. man, fanta- listen, fantastic. Nothing but success with that project, man. That, that'd be awesome. Wow. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So we've done a ton of TV and licensing yes. over the years in extreme sports and commercials with our athletes. So we have, uh, you know, uh, been in that world also with television and film. So there's... Over the years, also, I've been a consultant for Jeep, ESPN, Toyota, Dr. Pepper, you name it. I've been a consultant for the world of action sports and emerging culture projects. Wow. Now, listen. So, obviously, you stay close to the ground. You don't do anything with, like, uh, what's that? Like, like not the skydiving. Not that. What's that other sport? Yeah. Called? Like, bungee dumping. You don't do anything with that, do you? No, no. I respect <laughs> for my my poison. My poison is BMX okay, and skateboarding. Okay, you you said emerging culture. I'm like that's <laughs> yeah. Emerging culture is like a lot of like the different music lifestyle that you gotcha. doing. Gotcha. Okay. Like the like, cutting edge stuff. Okay. With art. Okay. So sh- now share more with the the emerging lifestyle culture. What does that actually mean? I mean, are, are, are is there a particular yeah. movie or a lifestyle that these guys, a, how do you guys Well, go? it's a movement with multicultural people outside traditional Southern California culture. Got you, okay. And so that, what that means is a great example is a friend of mine coined uh, the movement Afropunk. Afropunk, so you're going to, yes. Yeah, Afropunk. And you're like, oh, what's Afropunk? So Afropunk was uh, uh, my homeboy, his name's James Spooner, and young black people like that that like punk rock music. Got you. And, and they were kind of misfits or whatever. 
and but secretly a lot of different people of color were liking alternative stuff and it wasn't cool to like it gotcha. and so some of, these, some of these kids really were into that afro punk culture he coined the phrase he made a movie about it <clears throat> and then eventually the movie became a festival so you know even though I wasn't an Afro punk kid traditionally, yes. but I was an Afro punk kid in the sense of I was in the BMX and I was black and I was into skateboarding, which you know made it a misfit. You know, before it was cool. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, yeah, Jimmy, I'm I'm sitting here, man, and I'm saying, wow, where have you been? How come we didn't stay connected? Because man, this is crazy. I'm learning so much. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, man. <laughs> wow, we. So now, do you ever go and speak to like the local uh, elementary schools and high schools about what you do? Yeah, off and on through the last thirty years. Well, the first fifteen years, I did it a lot. Yes. Um, but uh, over the last this last fifteen, I do it often. I don't do it a ton, yes. but I do it often. So and Jimmy that ranges from college to. High school to elementary. So Jimmy Mack and what you do, you you've got an awesome following now, right? You got a, you've got what they call mm -hmm. groupies, right? Wow. Well, I wouldn't say group, but we definitely have you know people that have been following yes, following us for thirty years, and then the newer generation, the Gen X, like a little little bit of everybody. And now, you know, we've I've re, not rebranded myself, but um, reinvented myself. Um, through this new company, which has a whole new generation of young, young, old, and, you know, in between that. Yes. Because what, what I'll explain to you is in the sport of extreme sports, it's all ages. So when you were growing up, you would think of somebody on a BMX bike, you think of like your younger brother. Yes. But, but what's happened is people are doing their hobbies throughout the like 70 and over. So in BMX racing, there's age groups from three years old all the way to 75 and over. What? Listen, I, I want to see I, the dude on the bike at 75 because, man, with, with I, I don't know if it's arthritis, but I don't think I can get my legs to bend that far. Oh, you'd be, you'd be, surprised, <laughs> if, you'd be surprised if you work out. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I do. And I do. It's just... <laughs> yeah, the, the BMX racing yeah. is... So our market, you know, is not like you would think, oh, it's a 17 year old. It's not. It's, it's group from like 12 years old because we started with men's six. So it's like 11, 12, all the way to 75 and over. That's in the lifestyle of the sport and also competing as weekend warriors. Wow. In the country and world. That's one. That's Skateboarding awesome. is the same thing. It's not just like a. 12 year old kid. Yes. It's, you know, grown ups doing it on the weekends all over the world, including the young people. Wow. That's crazy. And then surfing, the same thing. And then now, which, you know, we used to work with bands in Vision Street where, you know, we were trying to help it cross over into the urban market, which now, an average African American person of color has a pair of skate shoes in their, um, in their, uh, their um, wardrobe closet, wardrobe yeah, closet. yeah, 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 yeah. Like they at least got one or two pairs, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but the um, the thing is that uh, it's become a lifestyle now. So yes. people like wearing alternative stuff as a lifestyle play. Yes. Um, and, you know, so you know our our market, you know, we're in that space. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Uh, the skateboard BMX type shoe uh, that you would wear, but our sneakers have a little swag to it because our my uh, my partner, who's one of the best designers in the world, he, uh, he he you know it's one of the best durable skate BMX shoes in the market right now. But the design or just have a really good flair to it because he's been able to really come up with a good formula for myself and my team uh, to really make some great design and performance shoes for the sport. And you could still be lifestyle in them. Gotcha. You know, now, it. now, Jimmy, let me, let me ask this question. You, you mentioned the age range of people in this lifestyle, right? 
So, yeah. with, so within your company, what's the typical age of some of your employees? Uh, that is, uh, well, my partner, he's two years older than me. He's 52. Okay. Uh, my vice president of the company, he's 35. Wow. And, and then, uh, let's see, everybody else is between 20, well, the athletes range from nine years old all the way to 55. Wow. That, that, that's a, that's so a the athletes range. Yeah. Aren't paid that are athletes, it's, a, it's that range. And so because this is a lifestyle, then you know exactly how to market to this lifestyle group. That's right. And then you hope to cross over in the general market yes. with everybody else as it grows. Wow. Now, wow, I, I, lost, my, I lost my thought, but has, has Nike... You know, and some of those guys tried to impede in your space in terms of the shoes? Yeah, they started a really cool program about 20 years ago. Okay. They make a dive in the skateboard. It's called the Nike SB program. It's still around. Um, you know, it's not their most popular division of the company, but it does well. Yes. Um, they did sponsor BMX for a while. They dropped it after a while. Um, which, you know, a company like that isn't in there for the culture per se. Yes. You know, they're really their core car, their core competency is running in basketball. Yes. So anything they can get on any of these extra markets is added value. So they kind of got, they go in and out of it, but they, they have a solid, uh, program. And we are competing against them, bands and about 16 other competitors. Okay. And we're one of the only East Coast sneaker manufacturers now in the sport. Everybody else is on the West Coast. Wow. Now, you, you, you were mentioning that, um, and, I, and I, I hope that I heard you correctly, every year there's this conference, right? Because, yes. Because mm-hmm. of the pandemic, have you been able to go to the conference or, or no? Okay, so that conference you're talking about is a trade show, yes. and uh, they, they the, the, there's multiple trade shows, but uh, they stopped the trade shows for a couple of years, and you know they're back now. Okay, but the, the other question I think you want to ask is competitions that we go to for all the live events that our athletes are competing in. Yes, um, they they were going on during the pandemic. Okay, you know it's like not the first. First year, and then like go, going in that second, it started back up before everything got super clear. Got you. Now, They're outside events, and the theory was that you know since it's outside events, um, the uh, the tri-state in these certain areas were okay with doing it as long as it was people were outside. Now, now, although you have sponsors, what's the process that you go through or what's the process that the company goes through when they want to sponsor a young person or someone in that space? What's the process that you guys go through when you want to sponsor someone? So one of my gifts that I realize I have is picking talent in yes. whether it's athletes or uh, music artists. And, stuff. and so I normally recruit uh, well, now I can recruit on social media by following different people I'm seeing trending. Yes. Uh, but I can look at it before they pop. Yes. So, like, I could see something in a up-and-coming rider that maybe another company can't see or yes. afford to do because they're not a smaller company. Gotcha. So, and then the other power is when you have athletes in your team, they recommend riders to you and check them out. Gotcha. And people send in their, if they're freestyle riders, they send in videos. Yes. Um, and then if they're racers or whatever, they send their resume in. Um, and then we're at all the big events, and I see who's doing good, you know, basically. But I'm seeing people before they get really good or they're good and they're getting ready to pop. Gotcha. And it's like a hard to find. You know, just like if you're out for football. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, now I'm going. I'm going to I'm going to mess this question up and just bear with me, right? 
when you say you're looking for someone, are you looking for someone who's actually talent and who is a major influencer? Am I saying that correctly? So, so are it's, you- a, it's a feel because some people might be more of an influencer yes. than a champion. Got you. Now, influencers are very popular to get in your marketing program. Before, it was all about the athlete and the performance and yes. personality. Got you. Now, no. we have people that we work with that are in our we call it brand ambassador program yes. that are influencers in the space but may not be performance gen- performance generated. Understood. Because I, I, wanted, I wanted to make sure I was saying it in such a way that I, <laughs> that I knew that I was talking about, and you knew that I was talking about there was a difference between the two. Okay, great. It okay. definitely is. Yeah. But okay. we find value in both now. Yes. Yes. And, and, so, and so the influencer, how does he or she become such, and how does he or she come to your radar? Well, I'm on social media all the time and I'm tracking trends in art, music, fashion, and alternative culture and pop culture. Yes. And uh, it could be an entrepreneur. Like there's a guy that's doing a really <clears throat> popular festival very soon. And, you know, instead of <clears throat> going uh, with his event, excuse me. Yep. We, you know, we want to sponsor him, so he's wearing these shoes, and he's in front of ten thousand people. Yes. yes. So you would never think like an entrepreneur could get a sponsorship just for being an influencer. You know. Yes. You look at all sides of it now, that connect in to people. Now, now, if someone is. <laughs> If someone is an influencer for you, right, is there some type of legal relationship that you guys have? How do you compensate yeah, you or her? It's organic. it's organic. Okay. Yeah, it's organic. It's about brand loyalty, organic. <clears throat> um, you don't really need a contract with those kinds of things. You want it not to be a corporate kind of thing. Got you. But, but, but more how- we're supporting their movement, you know what I mean? And, um, yeah, so that's kind of that. Now, if it was, uh, you know, Richard Branson or something, and we felt, you know, he's getting ready to do 40 commercials and, you know, he's going to space and, you know, maybe, we, you know, we would pay a fee okay. and then do something like that, you know, as an influencer, you know what I mean? So, but, but I'm saying in, in your space, how does an influencer – how is he or she compensated by you guys or recognized product by you guys? Support. Product support, which is like the equivalent to gold. Okay. When people say they can get product support from a company and they're sponsored, yes. from a pop, you know, pop underground, a pop culture brand, yes. it adds value to their worth and whatever they're doing. Okay, so, so unpack that for yeah. me. What does that mean? You guys give them the latest gear for them to wear? Yeah, the latest Union Square gear gotcha. for our product, our sneakers, our clothing. So this could be stuff that's not even out, that stuff that might drop six months from now. Yeah, but it could be what we have in stock now. Okay, got you, got you. Just like if you got an Adidas sponsorship, it would carry value for your program. You'd be like, yo, we're sponsored by Adidas. Yes. You know, and then you're going to funders and like, we also have a strategic partner with Adidas. Got you. <clears throat> And I'm an influencer for Adidas. Got you. It holds a it holds a money value in a different way. Understood. Wow, man, I'm I'm learning today. Wow, I am learning today. You, like they say, like the kids say, you're gonna learn something <laughs> today. All right, excellent. So now, where where, yes, where where are you now? Where do you you know using my crystal ball? And has always been one of my questions. Where are you five years from now? With your two companies. Well, we're close into our five year plan. Uh, we're three, we're three in on the five. So we have uh, different lateral divisions and projects uh, with Union Square. Yes. Uh, so on the business development side, uh, we're entering in on the government contract side uh, this next year uh, to do sneakers for the military and military, some other military uh, 
uh, uh, source projects yes. uh, that we're starting to get into that would supply uh, certain kind of sneakers for the, the Navy, uh, Air Force, and Army for when they have to buy, when they're sourcing regular sneakers for the different, uh, you know, for, for them working out or doing yes. their different things. So cool, we're man. getting into that that world. Yes. Um, we're also uh, opening up our first Union Square Action Sport Park. Yes. We did a public-private partnership with Gloucester Township, and uh, that project will be starting in May. We'll be building out 20 acres of land uh, for skate parks and bike parks that we own, and uh, national events, and then you know daily where people can come as a national destination to come ride and ride locally. Wow, man! <clears throat> wow. Um, yes, yeah, so we had that. Uh, we also own two properties, uh, event properties, uh, Union Square Cup, which is a national uh, action sport BMX skateboard event. Yes. And then we have the Union Square, uh, second annual Union Square Barbecue Jam, where it's uh, <clears throat> concert, uh, music, and riding, and free barbecue. Wow, free barbecue. I'm yeah, I I want me to be the influencer for that one. <laughs> yeah, you come you come through. You come through. And uh and then we're <clears throat> working right now with that twenty acres of land uh to build either our headquarters or we'll be a mile within that area to yes. you know build our new headquarters. Yes. Um and what else? What else? What else? And then um there's some other different things going on I can't mention, but understood. understood. But uh, there, there's some of the bigger things that we're working on in our five-year development, which we're three in. Wow, Jimmy, let me, let me, well, let me be the 100th person to say this to you. I am so proud of you, man. I'm so excited yeah. for you. My God, yeah, I, I know I'm, I know I'm not the first, so that's why I said let me be the 100th. No, person. it doesn't matter. I, I <laughs> You know, you're one of the oh, cats that I've been early in the year, so I, I mean a lot. Thank yes, you. yeah. Listen, man. Um, I'm going to open up this platform to you right now. If there's anything that you want to share that we did not <clears throat> cover with the listening audience, please do so now, my beloved. You know, I could say that uh, to everybody out there, be encouraged. I decided to start this new business in probably one of the most traumatic parts of my life. I had a uh, got injured eight years ago and over 30 year, 35 year bike career. Uh, I had two other major injuries and mixed in with hereditary. I lost my kidneys and uh, my first two years on dialysis after losing my kidneys, I was just focused on my health, trying to figure out the, the lay of the land with being on dialysis. And I felt like I was losing my life. Like my whole life has been so, you know, uh, very forward thrusted and then all of a sudden it came to a screeching halt and uh, I was like I want to get back to my purpose and I realized you know, I'd been searching my purpose I didn't even realize it was my purpose I just didn't know any different Yes. <clears throat> but when my life came to zero at a halt with the health thing and it's a terminal illness without getting a kidney transplant Yes. Uh, I you know I was suffering Yes. And uh, it came to me somehow getting back to my purpose. And I gave myself a choice. I said, I'm going to do my other business of 23 years. And, you know, the market got soft or I can do a new one and circle back for that other project that I did for years. And I decided to, to reinvent myself and do the Union Square project yes. uh, two years into dialysis. Yes. And that next day, I went from 95% dialysis and 5% my life that was barely left. That next day, I was 95% my life and my, my purpose and my business, 5% dialysis. And overnight, my life changed in the, after wow. those two years. And every day since then, <clears throat> it's been four years ago since I you know, made that change. My life has been super powered and dialysis has been a part-time job. And then I've been thrusting with the 
30 years, 35 years of passion with this new company that's turned successful in a matter of three years through the hardest time period in economic history. Yes. And uh, I'm, uh, you know, I'm back getting closer to getting a kidney. And, uh, awesome. and, you know, things are, you know, growing rapidly, quickly with the, the new businesses. And, uh, you know, I'm living my best life and yes. perspective of the situation is everything, but the power of the mind, yes. uh, power of positive thinking, uh, yes. which one of my greatest mentors I never met was Norman Vincent Peale. Yes. Uh, and, uh, Joseph Murray Murphy, who Steve, uh, passed on one of the greatest other books that I was a believer in and thinker in, but it got deeper in layers is the book by Joseph Murray about power of subconscious thinking. Yes. And those two things mixed into my philosophy of business is repetition and yes. showing up and obviously having a clear idea and great concept of business but you know most men fail 12 times and give up but the way i've done it is it's the 391st time you do things it's the 1200th time <laughs> and i've beat the process by repetition yes you yes. know and uh these are the things uh you know, that have helped me. And then the last thing I can share on a mind over matter level, and you could use it metaphorically, yes. is uh, I took karate <clears throat> at the highest level as a uh, elementary uh, student when I was in elementary school. And uh, we used to do shows in the early 80s at the big uh, um, basketball stadiums and stuff with the teacher, yes. uh, King John. And he had a show-stopping stunt that he used to do that stuck with me. And as I was getting on dialysis, I was like, how am I going to get needles, you know, two needles that are huge, the size of half a pen sometimes, you know, every other day? Yes. You know, how am I going to, you know, and I don't like getting stuck, you know, and this is how I'm going to survive. Well, I remembered the master, it was a, uh, Master Giacobbe with Kung Sudu Karate in Southern New Jersey. She um, would walk on glass and then stick these railroad ties in his, uh, the fat between his elbow, yes. basically, and then um, get a bucket, put, hang the bucket on the railroad ties with yes. glass in the buckets. Wow. And I used to see him do this, you know, Yes. Like with my own eyes. And I said, well, if he can do that, I can get stuck with these dialysis needles. Yes. You know what I mean? And life is, you know, my biggest uh, thing I share with people now is really mind over ma matter. Yes. And the power of your mind. And if you can visualize it, you can get through it. Yes. Or you can create it. Yes. You know? And in the mixture of repetition and uh, having faith, also, faith in uh, God or faith in something that's not there and b br bringing it to life, yes, you can accomplish anything. Absolutely. Wow, Jimmy. Listen, man, you you have just briefly been a inspiration to me, and I know you oh, will wow. be a inspiration to many. Because I, I didn't know this story, brother. But I am so okay. glad that you know your purpose. I am so glad that you're able to share your purpose and we're, we can uh, share your purpose with others. You're going to be all Thank right. You. You was a bad thank mother. you, brother. You was a bad mother. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, brother. Yes, sir. Well, as they, as I thank they, you. I thank you yes, sir. for being a leader in our community. And, you know, you were, you know, one of certain folks that I looked up to when I was getting into the whole nifty thing. Yes. And, uh, you know, uh, an example of, you know, a great teacher, great human being, a great athlete. You know, you have a history of being a great athlete. And knowing your history, when I saw that, it was always a great example of seeing, you know, great, you know, great big world. You know what yes, I mean? Sir. Yes, sir. That, uh, that 
and, and you also too, besides, I guess just you and Russell, but you also represented, you know, a super positive black role model beside, you know, CJ and Steve, the, you know, great human beings, Yes. but you know, not of the culture technically during that time period, but, uh, you know, you, you, you know, uh, I, I, I definitely would have to give you those props, brother, you know. Brother Jimmy, I am humbled by your kind words, but but it ain't about me today. It's about you. We want to celebrate your success, and <laughs> uh, we want to make sure that as many people as possible are following you. So so how do people follow you? How do people keep in touch with you? Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Um, the great way to, to follow me is uh, if you want to purchase product yes. and support our movement, unionsquareshoes.com. Yes. If you want to follow the vibes uh, and follow my journey through my different businesses and uh, in uh, different uh, ideology that I share, you go to BDG Industries on Instagram. Yes. That's boy, dog, girl, BDG Industries. And that's at BDG Industries on Instagram. And then to follow my company and see all the great things we're doing with my company, our athletes, and new products, you go to Instagram, Union Square CO. <clears throat> Union Square CO, one word. Got you. Now, now when, when, you, when you email me your headshot and your bio, all of that information will be in the bio, correct? Yes. Okay, because I want to. I want to. When we release the uh, the ep- this episode, I want to include your bio in there, so people, if they forget, they can they can see it online and they can make sure they follow you. But I tell you, brother, you are always welcome on the platform. If I don't reach out to you, you reach out to me. You always have a home here because you were inspirational. And I think one of the Thank I think you. one of the key things that you said. You had to understand your purpose. And I think that it, wow. And I, and I think you understood it. As, as the girls say, I understood the assignment, right? Yes, sir. You understood the assignment. So I am so proud of you. You, you are my hero. My God. Yeah, thank you. My God, brother. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Jimmy, no Matt, problem. this has been a pleasure, my brother. A pleasure, right? So yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, so let's you and I stay in touch and let's you and I uh, talk and text later on, man. It sounds good. Uh, text me your email and stuff. All right, will do, man. Peace, one love now. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. That concludes another episode of The Entrepreneurial Enclave with Kevin Wortham. The podcast that focuses on building maintaining, pivoting, planning, and investing in you, the entrepreneur. We hope you found this episode informative and enlightening. If you have any questions or comments about any of our episodes, please call 609-731-9311 or email kevin at minding dash our dash business.com we look forward to joining us for our next one until next time